And um, as the webinar progresses, so we have four speakers today, um, please put any questions you have at any time into the chat and I'm going to compile them all and we will have 10 or 15 minutes at the end of the session where all the questions to our presenters can be addressed. So um, yeah, please just pop them in the chat and um, they'll get asked at the end of all the presentations. So before we get going, um, Open Access Australasia acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present and continuing, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and to the Na Iwi Māori, the Tagata Whenua of Aotearoa. And I'm in Cairns, Gimoi, uh, region, and so I would like to acknowledge the Iraganji, Jabagai, and the Gimoi, Wollaburra, Yidinji as the traditional custodians of the land that I'm on. And um, I invite you to uh, put in the chat where you're calling in from as we get started. So I'm just kind of doing the intro here and I'm gonna pass over to our, our host for this session. Uh, Liz Walkley Hall is with us today. She's the Associate Director Engagement and Scholarly Communication at Flinders University. And she is recent, recently has been appointed the call representative to the SCOS board which is why she's hosting the session today with that hat on. Prior to this, um, Liz has held several key positions at Flinders, during which time she's maintained strong support for open access and open scholarship initiatives. Uh, she's also served across various committees as an ALIA member, including the Research Advisory Committee, convener of ALIA SA and various conference program committees. And Liz contributes to the to call on the OER Open Educational Resources Government Governance Board and has published and presented locally, nationally, and internationally, including as keynote speaker. So I'd now like to uh, introduce and welcome Liz. I'll give the mic over to you, Liz. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. And it's lovely to be here amongst uh, so many familiar faces and friends in the open access community. Naglu Tambari Naglu Yakanga. Ghana Yadanga Imparendi. I'm joining you today from the lands of the Ghana people here in Adelaide, South Australia, and acknowledge their continued connection to country here. I also acknowledge and uh, pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging. I'm delighted to be here today. So thank you for having us uh, in my new role as the, the SCOS um, um, board representative for Call. And thank you to members of the SCOS uh, community for joining us uh, at various time zones. I don't dare ask what time it is uh, in some parts of the world from where they're joining us, but we're very grateful to have you on an Australian and New Zealand friendly time zone. So thank you so much for making the time to join us here today. Uh, as Janet said, uh, we're, we're here to talk about all things SCOS, including the current pledging um, uh, rounds. And so we are, are grateful to have the support um, both in person and uh, via video link for, uh, sorry, via video content for one of our speakers today. So I'd like to get started by um, introducing you to our first speaker, who is Rosalie Lack. And Rosalie is the coordinator for uh, the Global Sustainability Coalition for Open Science Services, or SCOS, as we like to call it. Uh, she's responsible for managing the SCOS family community activities, implementing communications and contributing to strategic strategic initiatives. Uh, Rosalie's worked previously with the African Digital Library Support Network, the University of California, Los Angeles, California, uh, California Digital Library and Electronic Information for Libraries. She's a Master of Information Management and Systems from UC Berkeley School of Information and a Master of Studies in Law from UC Law San Francisco. Welcome Rosalie and thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Liz. And thank you to everyone for your time. I know it's precious. Um, and to join us for this webinar, I'm really honored that you've taken the time to do this. Appreciate it. And let me share my screen. I do apologize for my lighting. I don't know. It's just, I'm like in a dark hole. So sorry about that. Um, one second. Thank you. 
Okay, so wonderful. I'm going to um, launch right in to talk about SCOS. Um, as, as Liz says, here's the, the longer name, but we all say SCOS. So I'm going to just start my presentation with maybe a little bit of a provocative um, heading of Imagine a World Without Open Infrastructure. And this comes from a blog post that we recently posted on the SCOS website. And there's a link here and you'll get these slides so you can take a look at it. And basically we were really talking about the financial challenges that open infrastructure is, um, is facing. Um, as things, as we say, unpredictable um, revenue st streams, but also this kind of fundamental issue of funders and others like to support projects and not operations and what and what open infrastructure really needs is operational funding so that challenge remains um, one that's very um, problematic and then the second one the, I'm sure there's many <clears throat> excuse me many challenges but another one that really bubbles to the top is this idea that these are quote unquote free resources and of course we know they're not free they're um they're they're low cost or they're free to use. Yeah, which is great. Um, but there's definitely a cost to run them to keep innovating. And so to ask for funding for something that's free is is pretty, it's a difficult ask, but, um, but one um, we definitely need to make. And so if we think further into this scenario of, of possible futures without open infrastructure, we think about, for there's many on these slides, I'm not gonna um, go through all of them, but to give you kind of a sense, you think about the same way open access content is locked up in proprietary systems um, with open infrastructure, technical development can be locked up in proprietary systems. So there is an interoperation that, um, that is really necessary for collaboration and for, um, for having strong scholarly communication pro um, products. So the, the other item that I really like to stress is this idea that um, that these tools and services that are from the non-commercial open infrastructure community are um, are aligned with our library values, and this is not just a, an abstract idea. It it really show it really plays out in a very concrete way in the technical development of these infrastructures that they're thinking about things that we librarians think about. And usually things that don't make very much money, but are very important to our community. So, for example, equitable access that everyone has access, or that there's the widest possible participation. Everyone's contributing to the scholarly communication community. Their say is heard, and they're, they're publishing and they're accessing on both sides. And then, um, importantly, preservation. I mean, who thinks about keeping things long term? Um, that's what we do, and. Uh, and so these these values that are important to us actually, as I say, play out in the open infrastructures, non-commercial open, open infrastructures, and are forefront for them, and may not be as much and aren't as much in, in most uh, commercial infrastructures. But um, there is hope. There is a way forward. Um, and basically, it, a lot of it really comes around to a shift in our funding priorities, like what and practices, like what what are we funding and um, what are we supporting, and how can we collectively support um, these infrastructures? So, in the end, that we're we're collectively supporting the open science ecosystem. All right. So let me, with that kind of intro of um, there is hope in that context, their um, SCOS was born. And so with the goal to help sustain vital, non-commercial, open infrastructure that supports implementation of open science. And let me leap here, and, and this is the um, SCOS model. And um, I actually just joined SCOS literally, I think now just two months ago. And I have to admit, I was a little like, what is this model? And <laughs> trying to wrap my head around it. So let me explain it if you if you haven't heard of it before. It's a pretty great one and one I've, I had never seen before. So the idea is that SCOS endorses infrastructures for investment. So every year, sort of a call is put out and, and two to three or two to four infrastructures are selected that are um, given a kind of a 360 vetting. 
So uh, we look at financials, we look at um, strategic planning, at governance, at usage, who's using them, how widely are they used, um, and and also the, that there's a financial need. So um, so SCOS has this, so I'm distracted by someone in the waiting room, but <laughs> someone else is worried about that. Um, but um, so, so SCOS does this, um, kind of 360 review of infrastructures. And then our role really is promotion and vetting. And then, then we turn to consortia and to individual institutions. And we show you these, institu these infrastructures that we have chosen. And you can be confident that those have been fully vetted. They're critical, they're um, highly used, and, and they're um, used, critical for the research life cycle. And so you could you then consortia or individual institutions contribute directly to these infrastructures. And so our role really stays as this kind of promotion and helping to make the connection. And then we have a, another role, which I'll talk about in a moment. But as far as the, the funding aspect, we're really just there to help make those connections because we think it's really important. What we like about this model is that then that relationship between the infrastructure and the consortium individual institutions, that relationship is formed directly. And that is thus the sustainability model that that relationship continues over time. So I hope that was clear and I'm happy during the Q&A to, to um, answer any questions about that. And so who we are, um, we are actually headquartered under Spark Europe, but we are a global organization and we're serving all corners of the globe from obviously um, Australia, Australasia region, Africa, uh, Europe, of course, Latin America and US also. And um, just to give you a sense of what's gone on so far since we were formed, um, we've, ha we've had pledges from over 340 institutions across uh, 24 countries, and the total pledging amount to date has been um, 6.3 uh, million euros, which is a, um, a, a really successful and wonderful um, amount of money. But uh, let me kind of put that in context of what's been asked for in a moment. So first of all, just to give you a sense, these are the current um, infrastructures in the SCOS family of infrastructures. So once we, once someone's been selected, they are, kind of stay in the family and we have 15 infrastructures so far. Many, I think you might recognize and some you may not. And I really encourage you to, um, to look them up, to take a look at them. Um, they're all very, like I say, very critical, essential infrastructures and all doing really great works. And today we'll hear from Software Heritage and RDA, the, the recent additions to the family. Uh, this slide, again, it's hard to see here, but when you get them, you can take a look. I really like, because we created a slide that showed the technical connections between SCOS infrastructure and, um, and the rest of the open, um, non-commercial infrastructure. And so you can see the SCOS infrastructures are in the middle and they're connected to each other. And then broadly they're connected out into the network of the other non-commercial um, infrastructures. And so it really shows how if any pledges are made to these, the SCOS infrastructure, there really is a broad broadening amplifying effect out to the larger ecosystem, which is great. So now I have a series of slides that again, here I'm not gonna go through one by one. This information is actually on our website and our homepage and um, you'll get these slides, but I wanted to give you a sense of, of what these, the funding is looking like. So each year we have, this is our pilot phase in the very first year and the infrastructures have a target amount of what they are requesting to fund um, that they need for to help sustain them in some ways or in other. And then the percentage here is how much they reach this target during, um, there's a three year period where we really focus on particular infrastructures. So this is a um, pilot cycle. And then the, the second funding cycle with um, DOAB and open access and open citations, PKP, and you can see the targets and the percent raised, um, the target reached. This is the third funding cycle of archive, Redelic, um, this wonderful um, uh, Redelic. I could go into more detail, but I'm on time timed. Uh, DSpace, and then here again, the targets and the um, 
percentage reached around with Dryad, La Referencia, and Roar. And um, and then now with our newly, well, newly launched, not so new so much, but pretty new, our fifth cycle and the targets and the and the amount raised. And um, and definitely, as you can see, we're happy to, um, and I want to always celebrate 6.3 million euros because that's a lot of money and has done a lot of great work. So we can talk about that again, the QA, what types of projects that, that it has funded. But you can see that we're, if you notice the trend, we're starting to not reach our targets. And so that is becoming, you know, the challenges of the COVID era and economic times, there's that, but there's, um, but I think we need to, we need to get more creative about how we're reaching these targets. So that's, that's on us as well. And then we also reach out to the community and what, what can you do to help? So I kind of summarize it into promote, join, fund. And promote is is what we're doing right here today. You know, um, if you have an open infrastructure that you use, that you like, think about having a session with your colleagues, and or with your faculty and telling them about it. Getting promoting these um, infrastructures, and then I say join. Um, you all are uh, leaders in your community, so consider joining um, an open infrastructure, uh, joining their board, joining their advisory group. Um, joining a working group to, to share your expertise with these open communities. They, they really depend on the community to support them in more ways than just funding. And then um, finally, of course, there's funding. So consider pledging. And um, I think uh, each of the, these um, infrastructures will talk about how to do the pledging. But if, if you would like to um, contribute or, um, or learn more, please contact me. Here's my email address. I'm happy to talk more about this um, or answer any questions. And let's just keep our this mantra in mind of open science is built on open infrastructure. So thank you so much for your time. And uh, I will say it is 5 a.m. where I am. So, so thank you for listening to my froggy voice. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rosalie. And uh, that was, uh, was great to um, see the breadth and depth of work that um, is occurring and has occurred um, across those, those infrastructures. Um, so uh, just to ensure that we are staying on time, I would like to move to our, our next uh, speaker, which we have um, via um, a, a video. Um, so this is Moraine Grupeter. Um, I have, sorry, Moraine, apologies in your absence for your mispronunciation, no doubt of your name, but Moraine uh, is, our head, is the Head of Open Science Operations at Software Heritage, which is the Universal Source Code Archive. Software Heritage is a common infrastructure designed to collect, preserve and share all publicly available source code. One of the main services is the source code deposit, available for a variety of academic partners. Uh, many of which uh, um, I'm not uh, familiar with these abbreviations, but I'll read them out for you. CCSD for the uh, HAL French National Repository, uh, EpiSciences, IPOL, uh, some of these may be familiar to you, eLife, Sonodo, and uh, Invenio RDM, Math, uh, Dagstuhl, and others. As part of Software Heritage Open Science activities, Moraine is the contact point for the SCOS fundraising campaign and for the Open Science Partnerships. Moraine spent several years as a professional therapist before, uh, sorry, professional harpist, even more impressive, Moraine, <laughs> before earning a master's degree in computer science uh, from uh, the University Pierre et Marie Curie. And she joined the Software Heritage team in 2017. So as I mentioned, Moraine is joining us via video. So I'll just launch into sharing my screen and playing her video for us. I don't um, think we have any volume. My apologies. So no volume on that one. Um, there was something we needed to do, wasn't there? That uh... Uh, There's a little checkbox that says share audio when you go to share screen. Thank you, Janet. It's 
It's on the right. I think you'll have to stop sharing and then yep. reshare. All right, let me stop sharing and reshare. That's a good one. Thank you. Let's go again and see how we go. And I'll just. My apologies. There we go. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. My apologies for not being able to join you. And thank you for the organizing committee for having this video presented to you online. My name is Moran Greenpeter. I'm part of the Software Heritage team working on this ambitious mission, mission to collect, preserve, and share all software source code. And for the presentation today, I'm going to share with you a little bit of information about the software source code library and the archives and libraries interest group that we have launched thanks to the SCOS pledging round. What is software? This is an existential question that I had a lot of debate about with myself, with other people. And I imagine you have debated that at some point um, because software is all around us. And even though some of us think it's magic, I do think it's magic too. Um, with a computer science background, uh, we know that it's actually not magic. Software, can I see that there's a, a software projects that have a community around them. There's ideas that are designed, architectured, which are not the digital optic effects that we can find at the end. And there are a very large collection that we can find a very large collection of digital artifacts, including executable source code. Now, what's so special with a source code is that it is the access to the knowledge the knowledge that is embedded in the software and we want to keep alongside data and publications. Software is now increasingly recognized as a research output. We can see that with these two uh, quite recent documents, well, 2019 and 2021, stating and calling to promote software development as a valuable research activity and research software as a key enabler for open science. In the UNESCO recommendation on open science, we see source code that must be included in the software release and made available because again, the source code is written for humans that can read it, not for machines. It is then compiled and executed in the machine. But if we want to understand what the software does, we need the source code. And as a pillar alongside publication and data, we need to know the connections when writing an article and using software or producing software, because software can be a tool that is used, can be an outcome produced during the research, and it can be the object of research. We need these links between the data, the publications, and the code. Now, software is not created only in academia. And most software research software that is created in academia depends on very large web of dependencies outside of academia. And in, even with the infrastructures, we need to understand how software is fragile. Source code can disappear. And research libraries have this important pivotal role where it comes to software to make these artifacts understandable and having giving keys to the researchers and the libraries community. We have a long road ahead to make software available, findable, traceable, and solve a little piece in the reproducibility crisis. A question to you, 
have you met software archival requests in your library or your organization? And if you can't share now in the chat, this is something that really interests me to know and to help solve. Because one of the things that I've, de I've, I've done is at Software Heritage is working on software metadata and understanding the context of the software. And we are we want to have um, uh, other features that can really assist libraries. And for that, we do need you. We need you. We need to. We want to help libraries, but we need you in our journey. Now, software deserves a special library because it's a special guest. And Software Heritage plays this role as the Alexandra Library of Source Code. And I don't say that just because it's a nice uh, tagline. I say that because we do collect software that is all around and bring it to our infrastructure that is um, made for the long term. It is an international and non-profit initiative. We launched it in 2016 and we're hosted with INRIA and we're hosted by INRIA in partnership with UNESCO and with a very um, large um, uh, community of members, of sponsors, of um, and, and ambassadors as well that are um, taking our message and promoting our mission and supporting our mission. And this is important that we are here for the from the community and for the community, for the larger community, not only academia, but all society. Now, it is, as I said, an open infrastructure. We collect, preserve, and share source code, and it is the largest collection today that we know of. Maybe you know another one, but we have 19, more than 19 billion um, unique files and more than 300 million projects. We are serving the scholarly ecosystem as this baseline, the universal source code archive, serving not only academia, industry, public administration, and cultural heritage. And in academia, we are trying to do this connection inside the scholarly ecosystem through different European projects, but also um, with existing infrastructure that are now try that are already connected to software heritage or that are working on implementing these connections with scholarly repositories with publishers and with aggregators in 2023 we are very grateful to have been selected by scott for the fifth pledging round with rda and being part of this impressive um scott family is really very is really nice to be part of that and with this, we are proposing the archives and libraries interest group, giving you support, giving you assistance, uh, having a dedicated channel for the members and also access at the higher levels to the same um, benefits that sponsor get. Behind the scenes, we have a dedicated team, technical and non-technical. Well, I'm not uh, we from all all kind of expertise and it, they are very dedicated and engaged and I really like to thank each and every one of them building one part or the many different part of this big puzzle which is software heritage. I would like to thank you for your attention and if you are interested in more information about the league or about software heritage don't hesitate reaching out having a longer session describing exactly what we are doing, showing exactly how the feature works. That would be amazing to have. So thank you for having me. I'm going to stop sharing now. And ah, I don't know if this works. Well, I thank you and I hope to um, see you again and uh, meet maybe as part in one of the Alig uh, occasions. Thank you. All right. So, uh, as as Moraine uh, uh, said, uh, um, opportunity to uh, take some questions from this group that we can pass back um, 
uh, to her at the um, at the end of this session or anything that comes uh, up in conversation, I guess. Um, uh, and she did send apologies for not being able to attend in person. So um, it was great to still have some video content. I'd like to move to our next presenter now, uh, which is Hilary Hanahoe, who's uh, uh, joining us and I don't dare ask for your time zone either, Hilary. So thank you uh, for making the time at this time for you. Um, Hilary may be known to some of us already. Uh, she is the Secretary General of the Research Data Alliance, an international nonprofit volunteer organization addressing the needs for open and interoperable sharing and reuse of research data and building those social, technical and cross-disciplinary links to enable such sharing and reuse on a global scale. Currently, RDA has a community of, 14, of over 14,500 individual data professionals from 151 countries who are collaborating on different open science and open data initiatives and activities operating under six fundamental guiding principles of openness, consensus, harmonization, community-driven inclusivity, not-for-profit and technical, technology neutrality. Hillary is passionate about the work of the Research Data Alliance and its vibrant volunteer community working to enable the open sharing and reuse of data across the globe. Over to you, Hillary. Thank you. Thank you so much, Liz, and good afternoon or good morning. Um, myself and Rosalie are on the same timeline, so I'm in Central European uh, time zone. That's okay. Um, so thank you very much to Open Access Australasia and to you, Liz, as well, for uh, organising this and giving us the opportunity to share some insights about uh, our, our initiatives. I'm sorry Moran's not with us this morning but um, or today, but I would like to give you some insights on the Research Data Alliance. Um, I'm not sure how many of you have heard of it. If you If you have, please put it in the chat and I'll check that afterwards. But I'd like you to think a little bit about um, a world without electricity or a world so that would mean we wouldn't be charging our phones and we wouldn't be on this call together, by the way, um, or we wouldn't be um, able to cook our meals. Or So we rely a lot on light. Huh? And I like to think that data is light that data has uh, provides significant value and um, when, of course, used and structured in a correct way. So uh, the data that we have and use today is as almost as essential as light. And there is, I think, no going back uh, from the digital data uh, revolution. And actually, if you can see this uh, growth chart, you note that in 2010, we had two zettabytes of uh, data. Um, last year, we produced 120 uh, zettabytes. And next year, we're going to 181. And I thought when, when I saw this and read these statistics, I thought, but what is a zettabyte? You know, I mean, how, how there are these concepts? How do we understand or, or, or if you like, some sort of put that into some perspective. Well, if a zettabyte was a trip to a round trip to the moon, it would be uh, 130, 1,300 round trips to the moon is a, is a um, the, the bot for one zettabyte. So if you multiply that by um, 180, so that, are, you know, in six months time, that's the, the volume of data that we are going to produce across the globe, that's 235,000 return trips to the moon in length. Yeah. Now, of course, of those 180,000 zettabytes, we don't need to preserve all the data. We don't need to store it all. But how do you make that choice? How do you decide what to keep, what to throw away? And also, um, what way to make the that data that you do keep uh, preserve it, have value, make it reusable, make it findable, make it accessible. Hmm? There are farmers in remote areas in Africa have access to essential climate uh, and agricultural data. And this assists them in making accurate crop uh, and life-saving actually crop management um, systems. Hmm? 
So a simple interface that they have by having access to uh, both climate and agricultural data. Libraries and librarians, so many of you will note this. Of course, you are now charged with uh, creating digital archives and replicas, of course, of artefacts. And, you know, libraries and librarians are the gatekeepers of cultural, historical, um, institutional memory. So it's really important, the digital preservation and curation aspect. And in the COVID times, um, having a rapid access to data and knowing how to structure and format that data in such a way as that the researchers could share it so we could make um, save time and resources in order to ensure that the vaccines were found and therapies were uh, cured. And these are all aspects around data, of course, but they are also three concrete examples of work that the Research Data Alliance community produced um, and gave back to the globe. And I like to think, I, I mean, I, uh, Liz said it in my open, in the bio, I'm quite passionate about my job. I am the lucky, I have the best job in I represent a community of over 14,000 people who, as I like to think, have infectious generosity as this book. If you haven't read it, it's very it's a very interesting um, one on the TED Talks, of course. But this is these are volunteers who believe that by working together, they can actually uh, find solutions and not only implement them, but actually give it back to the community. So as Liz said when she in the opening, the RDA is fun, built on these guiding principles. Yes, of as you see to the side there of openness, consensus, inclusivity, harmonization, it's community driven and non-profit and technology neutral. And we have an ambitious vision, just like the software heritage, that researchers and innovators can openly share and reuse data across technologies, across disciplines and across countries to address the grand challenges of society. And those any technology, any disciplinary area, domain agnostic as well, but any disciplinary area and in any country. And we do that by building the social and the technical bridges. And I showed you, I gave you three examples, the crop prediction for the farmers in Africa, the COVID guidelines for far, uh, funders and researchers, and of course, the digital preservation and curation. They are just three of almost 200 different solutions that have been found uh, and worked on by the community. And they're the technical bridges. But we also work on the social bridges to enable the this uh, vision because by building connections, by building, uh, providing the network, we have seen the untold, if you like, advantages of collaborating together and finding those connections and, and building, of course, also trust, because trust uh, breeds uh, wonderful collaboration. And the community, the Research Data Alliance works in three very simple ways through working groups, through interest groups and through communities of practice. The working groups are very specific. They provide things like standards and code and concrete outputs. When they've done their job, they either maintain it, um, but then they, if you like, retire the, the group. We have interest groups because there are so many different challenges in data sharing um, and to achieve this vision across all different, um, you know, these disciplines and technologies. So the interest groups uh, focus, they're more like fora, if you like. And often, in fact, they set up working groups to produce the outputs. And then we have communities of practice, which are larger organization uh, groups, more more. And the one their domain and disciplinary focused and the one we have in fact is around agricultural data because it's one of our largest communities so we believe of course that without uh, data the world would be uh, like dark without like without light but that data needs value it needs structure it needs experts and it needs the research data alliance so we would like we are an open infrastructure, as was explained by Rosalie at the beginning. Open infrastructures are completely free. Everything that the com community does is open. The community already provide a lot of their time. 
Um, but of course, it's difficult to sustain that because if something's open and um, nobody understands why they need to fund it. We are um, seeking support in this, uh, in this round of discuss funding to in, enhance our um, community in the Southern Hemisphere, in the lower and middle income countries, particularly in the Southern Hemisphere of the globe, where we have less community, but who would we would really benefit as a global community from their work, but also to try to provide um, standards, to create standards, to get that interoperability, that findability. So uh, this is the uh, uh, the funding group according to how Scott do it, and we are um, so hoping that you will think about pledging to uh, to the Research Data Alliance. Apart, we have an organisational assembly. That organisational assembly supports us uh, in terms of an organisational vision. So the the outputs that are produced are, of course, produced by groups of experts, but they are implemented by organisations. And it is really important for us to have the organisational voice in the community. So all the SCOS pledgers, that are, we are welcoming them to become part of our organisational members for which we have uh, specific benefits and things which we can talk about later. But I am very grateful for your time and attention and happy to answer any questions that you might have. Stop sharing. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Hilary. Um, so... We have finished with uh, plenty of time for opportunity for some questions and I welcome uh, members of the audience to uh, use the raised hand function or to uh, provide them in the in the chat uh, as we've kind of uh, gone through the rounds. I can't see any there just now. Thank you, Janet, so much for popping um, that collection of links through the chat as we've been uh, presenting. That's terrific to have those there uh, um, for um, the audience to refer to. Um, but certainly welcome any questions, comments, uh, or uh, thoughts that people may want to, to share with the group now um, or ask Hilary or Rosalie directly. And maybe um, while people are doing that, I can't see any raised hands. Apologies if I've missed you. Um, just uh, perhaps turn your microphone on and, and <laughs> start speaking if, if I've missed a raised hand. But maybe while people are thinking, um, uh, Rosalie, I, do, I did have a question um, for you actually around um, some of those uh, pledges in the past. I know you presented uh, you know, those, um, those numbers for us. Um, but uh, just that very broad brushstroke perhaps of, of what they've uh, supported those members to do uh, in the past in terms of their aims and goals and, and um, help us understand how those pledges kind of work. Um, yeah, great question. So they, uh, the organizations come to us and say, what what is their, their greatest needs? And um, let me think about kind of how things clump i mean they do they are definitely things that, that normally funders may not um, fund so some of it is operations and actually being able to hire you know a part-time staff person for a lot of um, people or don't have communications or marketing or fundraising staff because they're focused on the community and and working and developing their their tools so sometimes the funding can help support um hiring a staff member. One thing that I was looking through actually, I think recently I was actually looking back at this question, interestingly, and noticed a lot of people are, uh, there's a certain amount of legacy code out there. And so there's also um, asking for funding to, to upgrade code, which, you know, that is not a sexy topic <laughs> and will be hard to get funded. So a perfect, a perfect thing for, um, for, to just help very much needed to keep the, the the organization running is the kind of working on this legacy code. So yeah, help hiring staff, working on legacy code. And then um, Hillary just showed some examples of, of expanding the reach into the global South. Again, really worthy projects that, that, that may not find funders in the traditional funding way, so. Fantastic, thank you. And Hilary, I know you did just speak to, to that, but is there anything you did want to expand on from what Rosalie just um, mentioned there in terms of the, the breadth, perhaps, of the, the reach that you're trying to achieve um, globally? 
<laughs> sure. And then I'll answer David's question in the chat. Oh, that's fantastic. Okay. Thank but, you. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, um, so I, I suppose we're traditionally funded. We were set up in 2013. We were launched in 2013. But there was a, a lot of discussion before uh, that for perhaps two to three years before that by funders as to um, from across the globe as to the need, you know, this digital de uh, evolution, revolution idea. This um, And how would they, yes, they need to fund it, but how would they actually get the people on the ground to work? So, of course, the funding came from um, what we like to call the global north. In fact, there's a big, I was at a meeting yesterday debating this. Uh, and in fact, we decided we're not using the global south anymore. But because Australia, of course, the Australian government have been a long term supporter of the uh, of RDA, uh, the NSF and the EU. Yeah. But because that they're the traditionally the if you like the funding um, countries where we received it, the programs and the community in those countries, the ambassador work like Rosalia uh, referred to um, has been much more in, in, in those parts of the world. And we haven't really had, I suppose, the possibility financially um, and also with COVID, the opportunity to actually focus on specific um, parts of the globe where we were less represented, but where we would benefit very much from getting um, more collaboration. And they would benefit, of course, from the work that the community is doing. Um, so, I mean, that's our if I think that when I went to La I spent five weeks in Latin America recently, we have 700 members from Latin America before I went there. Yeah, that's less than five percent of our community. That's not OK. Yeah. So we 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 need if we want to be truly, truly global and try to achieve this really high ambition of open science. Yes, that also the software heritage, but all the SCOS infrastructures are aiming for. You know, we really, you know, global is, is global. But very quickly to answer David's question in chat. So the criteria, we have different models. The criteria for large and small is the number of FTEs, the number of full time employees um, in an organization. Uh, I think it's uh, that. So um, I know it's explained on the web platform very well. We we went with the SCAF uh, sort of bounds, but that's how it works. Thank but you. I'm happy to give more information if that's required. Thank you. And I see we had a follow up question, David, um, uh, that uh, draws Angus into the conversation. <laughs> Angus, did you want to take that on notice or are you uh, happy to to jump in now? I can, I can just add to that. We classify just just from memory, we classify small institutions um, as any institution um, with FTEs below 18,000 and large with any institutions with FTEs above 18,000. We, we sort of looked at the, the, the breakdown of our universities and the classifications and that seemed to be the, the best way to do that. Um, just to add here, uh, and I hope my internet's not playing up too much, it seems to be having a, it's my internet got up on the wrong side of the bed I think today. Um, we will be talking more about the SCOS agreements that we run through the consortiums and the way that we manage the pledges um, with our members. Um, that's been scheduled into one of our regular procurement update meetings um, which, and it will be the next one on July the 3rd at 12 p.m. So anyone that's on our content community list um, will have been sent those invites and we'll send out a reminder um, a week or so beforehand just to let people know that that um, uh, that the SCOS uh, pledge process will be on the program for that meeting and then we'll go into um, uh, that and answer all of your SCOS pledge uh, questions in regards to call uh, at that session. Terrific. Thank you, Angus. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I agree, Janet, the role of call is is critical to support us in, um, you know, uh, how, how that actually works from a, a um, operational, I guess, uh, point of view, you know, and, and, and make it all work for us. So thank you, Call, for, for the support there too. Um, I thought Moraine asked us a really interesting question in her presentation, which was, you know, have we had those archival requests for, um, for around software in our libraries, in our research communities? And um, I think 
you know, just uh, putting that call out for if there are any, um, you know, use cases, I guess, um, for for software heritage um, from our communities, I think would be really useful and interesting to follow up on. So um, I think no matter how how large or small that, that that might be, I think Moraine would be really interested to hear from us in in terms of, of that question. And so please feel free to, to uh, either reach out to myself or, or to Moraine directly um, to, to pass that forward um, and, and just uh, give them, um, I guess, the, the um, Australian New Zealand um, perspective on, on what those use cases might be from our communities and, and our, our, um, our, our domains. Um, I'm just going to check that there's no uh, other questions that we're um, uh, on standby for, or if there's anything else, um, if I've missed a raised hand, I apologise, but please do jump in if there's uh, questions or uh, comments that you want to share with our speakers today. And again, if, if um, people would like some time to think about that, I'd just like to um, acknowledge both, both um, Hilary and Rosalie and Moraine for that matter, um, kind of all spoke to our, our shared values in this space. I think that was a really important uh, unifier for me across your presentations uh, in terms of, you know, things like equitable access and, and reproducibility, you know, um, they really resonate, I think, um, you know, with our library and librarian values of, of making sure that, that things are available for, you know, um, not just current users, but, you know, those, those future iterations of uses that, you know, we may, may, may not have visibility of um, from where we sit now, but, um, you know, ensuring continuity for, for future generations. And, you know, those challenges are, are not, uh, uh, you know, not, not insurmountable, but they, they can, um, they can feel so sometimes, I think, from our, our individual organisations. So the opportunity to work collectively uh, on, on these challenges, I think, is, is um, more important than ever. So to me, that was a really unifying theme that, you know, came across really strongly, uh, you know, just uh, looking at those things together today. Um, might seem obvious, but, uh, you know, it doesn't hurt to, to I think, call it out again, um, that, that those things that unite us in, in library world. Uh, Janet, I haven't seen any further questions pop up. So, um, you know, we're probably getting close to time anyway. Um, and if we have covered off uh, things in, in the presentation for everyone, um, maybe we can uh, um, thank our speakers and, and uh, let them prepare for their days ahead or, or take a power nap uh, before they prepare for their days ahead. Um, so um, on behalf uh, of, of the um, Open Access Australasia community, I would like to thank you for making the time to join us this morning. I thank Moraine for preparing her video and recording uh, for us so we could play it here today. That's no small undertaking either, I know. So uh, it was terrific to have you on the call, Rosalie and Hilary. Thank you so much for, for um, getting up um, super early for us in your time zones. We really appreciate the uh, Australia, New Zealand friendly time zone that you were able to make yourselves available for. Yeah, and I'd like to add my thanks as well, and also to you, Liz, for being our our MC of the session today. <laughs> and um, when you just look at the back catalogue of initiatives that SCOS has promo uh, promoted and helped to support, I mean, what would we, where would we be without some of those those amazing resources that we now think of mm -hmm. as just like a you know, an everyday thing, you know. Um, so yeah, super important to support these open infrastructure initiatives. But yeah, thank you. Thank you very much everyone for coming and thank you to the speakers. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Have a lovely end to your day.